The information and examples included in this summary presentation are designed to support the learning of the course objectives for part two, as measured on the second course assessment. This brief presentation only addresses some of the course objectives for part two, those that are related to the positive models, along with some good examples related to the different types of validity that are addressed in part two. The information and examples provided here can help you better understand all the objectives for part two, and it's a good idea to sort of follow along with your notes about these objectives as you review this information in the presentation. So the first objective that's going to be addressed is the very first one for part two, and that's your ability to distinguish between positivist and interpretive or anti-positivism research approaches. So let's, let's just quickly review the, the main um, elements of interpretivist research um, because I want to lead in following this with all the stuff related to positivism, which is what this part two is all about. So interpretivist research is typically inductive. Those are the models. So you're going you're gonna to sort of generate theories based on observations that you make. Um, both qualitative and quantitative data types are addressed in interpretivist research in general. Again, all of this will be discussed in more detail in, the, um, in, in part three. Um, so, and some of the common models that, sh that you're going to be learning about in part three include case studies, focus groups, ethnographic research, and, and I put action research in both of these categories because it's, it can be um, an, a, a type of interpretivist research. That is, you can take an, an interpretivist approach to action research um, or a positivist approach or both. And I'll say more about this in part three or at, or at, and at the end of part two, so about action research. So let's look closely then at, at how positivist research is, is different from um, interpretivist research designs. So positivism, again, it, it's sort of, its focus is that science or knowledge creation should really be restricted to what we can observe and measure. And it typically starts with theories that can be directly tested or or hypotheses that are part of theories that, that can be tested. So positivist research is typically deductive in nature in its design. Um, the data types are typically quantitative. That is, data are, are often reduced to numerical representations, even though the existing data may be uh, more verbal information in nature, more text-based in nature, it can be reduced to quantitative. Um, and, and the three designs categories that we're going to be addressing in this presentation include pre-experimental research designs, experimental designs, and quasi-experimental designs. So let's look then at the pre-experimental designs. So for this objective, and again, I'm jumping ahead in the list of objectives in your notes, you should be able to classify examples of pre-experimental research designs. So in this, uh, in, in my examples coming up, I'm going to sort of focus on, as our context, the use of kind of technology su supported resources or interventions in, in the classroom and we can think about somebody using a piece of technology that is connected to an AI system as one of our treatment ideas. Or, so, so that's sort of going to be the, the approach uh, for the examples that are in this presentation. So the first type of pre-experimental design is called the one-shot case study. And a one-shot case study is a weak experimental design that involves one group that's exposed to a treatment. In this case, the silhouetted student at the computer, the treatment is maybe something related to AI on the computer. Then they're post-tested. 
and then you would just examine what the what 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 your the status of your variables were after this um, after these these subjects were exposed to a treatment. So again, a weak um, a weak design. Another pre pre experimental research design is the one group pre test post test. So again, in this case, you have um, uh, some subjects that are that are exposed to a treatment, and you pre test them in advance, and then you post test them after the treatment experience, and you examine any differences that uh, that um, that you can observe. So again, it's a weak it's a weak design because you don't have anything to compare any gains to. Um, one one really good um, sort of obvious thing that happens that you'll learn more about is the fact that if you take an assessment twice, the second time you take it, you almost always do better than the first time, regardless of what happens in between. So we call that a threat to to validity. It's called a testing threat, and so if you don't have a, another group to compare this to that didn't get the treatment, then your results could be susceptible to that threat. The static group comparison is another weak experimental design that involves at least two non-equivalent groups. One receives a treatment and then both are going to be post-tested. So this is common in educational research where two different or existing classes are used in a study. So in this graphic, and in others to follow, the child with the arms in the air who appears to be running represents the student who is not assigned a computer-based AI treatment. This student would be in the control group and seems very happy or maybe out of control or maybe both. Um, so again, in static group, these are existing groups, so these might be two completely different classes. Um, and then they are then both post-tested and you can compare their results. Now, for those of you who are teachers, you can probably already see uh, an important issue with this, and that is that there's no possible way that the students in both of those classes are going to be equivalent on in, in all ways, um, because students are not assigned to classes randomly, typically. Um, so again, another weak design, but very common in educational re research. A slightly better one is the static group pretest post test, which is the same as the um, the previous one, but in this case, both tests, both groups are pretested, and both groups are post tested, and then at least you can make a comparison about the amount of gain that happened between those two groups, and if so, you can make some reasonable conclusions that it may that any differences between those two groups may or may not have been due to the to the treatment. The next group are actual experimental research designs, and so um, these are going to be some of the most rigorous designs in, um, in in research. The first one is the randomized post-test only control group. So in this case. Um, Again, it's an experimental design, and it involves at least two randomly formed groups. So you take an entire population of subjects, and again, in this case, the population might be one, all the kids at one school. That's the, whole, that's the entire population that you're going to be focusing on. And then you randomly select half of them to be in one group and half of them to be in the other. And the other could be what's called the control group in this case. So in this case, one group receives a treatment. In this case, it could be AI. Um, the other one doesn't. Um, and then both groups are post-tested. So again, similar to um, in, the, um, in the earlier example, except that the students are randomly selected to be in these groups. And so it minimizes some of the threats to, the, to, to validity in this case. In the randomized pretest post-test control group design, it's an experimental design that involves, again, at least two groups of randomly selected, randomly selected from your population sample. Um, but unlike the previous de uh, design in this one, both of the 
groups, all the subjects in both the groups are pre-tested and all of the um, subjects in both groups are then post-tested. So this is a, this is a very, very strong um, research design because it minimizes a lot of threats to validity in this case. Now, there is an issue with pre-test, post-test designs, and I'll talk about that in the next type of, of research. So in, in order to deal with the effects of pre-testing, which, as I mentioned earlier, could be a threat simply because um, most people perform better the second time they take any assessment, whether there's been any kind of treatment or not, um, one way around it is is a design called the randomized Solomon IV group. And that's uh, a, an experimental design that involves random assignment of subjects to each of four groups. And then two groups are pre-tested and two are not. And one of the pre-tested groups and one of the unpre-tested groups receive the experimental treatment and then all four of the groups are then post-tested. So that's the randomized Solomon IV group. Final category of research designs in the positivist um, group are quasi-experimental. So in this case, you need to classify examples of quasi-experimental designs. And one of the um, the reason why this has a separate category is because it's, it is often difficult or impossible or, or even unethical to randomly assign subjects to treatments or control groups. So, and if you're an educator, you can just, you can just imagine how difficult that would be. So the quasi-experimental approach addresses designs that don't include random assignment. So, the first group is called matching, and matching is a research design where experimental and control group subjects are matched, but not using random assignment. This design can be useful when, for example, researchers want to ensure that experimental and control groups have the same mix of general ability level. So this graphic depicts matching subjects by ability, and then randomly assigning one member of each pair to a treatment group and the other to a control group. So this is an important variation in design if ability might be a variable that could impact the dependent variable in a way that, that you don't want it to. And so this could help ensure you don't have too many students in one group who just have a higher level of ability starting out than, than the other groups, simply because of how they were randomly picked. Again, usually a problem with smaller, um, with smaller subjects. Then, we have the counterbalance design, and that's um, a design where all groups receive all treatments, but each group receives the treatment in a different order, and all the groups are post-tested after each treatment. Th this can be a very important experimental design or quasi-experimental de design in, um, in in education because if you if you have a treatment that you're fairly confident is going to have an impact on learning, then it would be in some cases unethical for you not to allow all the students an opportunity in your class an opportunity to have that um, to have that experience. So in this case, everybody gets it. It's just that they get it in a different order and at different times. So that's a counterbalance design. Then there's the time series in which, where again, um, all groups receive all the treatments but each group receives the treatment in a different order and all groups are post-tested after each treatment. So again, you can see in this graphic, you can see different groups and uh, post-tested in different orders. Okay, so the next section of this presentation addresses validity. And, and the reason why it's important to kind of pull this out is because validity is associated with very different concepts in, in part two. You have internal validity, which addresses the nature of how well a study is designed and how well variables are controlled. Um, you have external validity, which is how generalizable are results from a study to other, other groups, other populations. You have threats to validity that, that are things that could help um, uh, 
you have a difficult time determining what what the actual impact of your treatments were. And then you have something called construct validity, which is which happens to be assumptions about whether or not you're measuring what you think you're measuring. So all of those are very, very different. And so validity is addressed. Uh, and so these these examples and notes address validity. Um, the, the different types. So a little bit, a little more information about that. Let's take a look at that. Okay, so so the first one, first objective to address is to explain the difference between type one and type two errors and identify common strategies used to minimize such errors, that is to improve internal validity. So type one and type two errors typically um, relate to internal validity they typically relate to positivist research designs. And so I want to talk a little bit about this before we get into, um, into internal validity. So first of all, I have this graphic in the notes where type, type 1 errors are false positives. And what that means is that you do a study, let, let's say you do a study where you implement some AI and it has a really good impact on what it is you're measuring. Um, what your variable of interest is. Um, and, and you say, aha, the, the AI made a difference. Well, that it could be a false positive is the, if the difference was something else, like simply the fact that if you test somebody twice, the second time they take the test, no matter what happens, it's, it usually goes up. So that's a, fa a false positive. A type two error is a false negative where your variable of interest or your treatment variable actually did have a significant impact on your, on your learners, but because of your study design, um, you didn't observe any difference. And in that case, that would be a type two error. Um, that is often the case when your instrumentation is bad, when, you're, when your testing is, is not appropriate or not well designed. So the next objective that really does help paint a better picture for a lot of the information presented in part two uh, has to do with your ability to categorize descriptions and or examples of threats to validity, that is types one or two errors, as one of the following, history, maturation, testing, instrumentation, mortality, and regression. So I'm gonna give you a good example here of a scenario and this, I'm going to focus just on mortality. That, that's what this example um, uh, provides. So it'll be an example of a, of a type 1 error, a classic type 1 error due to mortality. And there's good information in the course notes about the other uh, threats to validity. So suppose a school district is exploring an option to implement AI reading buddy program, uh, an AI reading buddy program in their, in their schools in order to raise reading scores. So if they wanted to determine if that might be effective, they hired this researcher to investigate. So all 12 schools in the school district are included in this study. Now, half the schools are randomly assigned to the AI reading buddy uh, policy or program, and the other half just continues with their existing reading program, no, no AI reading buddy. So the researchers plan to compare scores from the beginning of the year, the pretest uh, in reading ability to the end. So they're gonna go through the, the, the whole year. Now, um, uh, assume for, the, for this situation that all the schools have roughly the same uh, number of students at each school, at each of the 12 schools. And so, and let's say that this reading buddy program is for grades first through third. So pretty good population here. <clears throat> so, but at the, at the end of the study, so, so the study, are, so the, the treatment unfolds over the year, there's AI reading buddies, and then they take the post test. And, and what, they, what they find out is that the students assigned the AI reading buddies, their scores are are significantly higher at the end of the year than they were at the beginning, whereas the, the control group with no reading buddy, the scores did not improve as much. However, so, so, they, so they say, aha, the AI worked, our treatment worked. But there was a problem. Two of the schools had um, 
something unusual happened throughout the year. They happened to be in parts of the community where they were serving a lot of migrant farm workers. And so the students at that school, first of all, were much higher population of English as a second language students. So their reading scores were already lower than, than what was typical. Uh, but also during the year, many of the families left the community during, during the year. So at the end of the, um, at the end of the year, during the post-test, many of the students who did poorly at the beginning and who may not, you could assume, wouldn't have, um, wouldn't have, have gained as much, uh, these students, um, they left. So they weren't part of the, of the post-test population. So in reality, the, the, the scores in the AI group likely would have been much lower or at least somewhat lower when taking the data. So it's possible given this situation that the, um, that the researchers experienced such high mortality that the results were skewed for that and they ended up with a false positive or a type one error. Okay, so we're gonna shift gears and look at construct validity. And so construct validity is, um, is very different from internal or external validity. So let's take a look at how you can establish construct validity in a study. So construct validity examines how well a given measurement scale is measuring the theoretical construct that it's expected to measure. So there's two general categories of construct validity. These are um, theoretical and empirical. Theoretical relies on expert judgment and empirical relies on actual data. So let's look at two primary ways to establish theoretical construct validity first. And, and let's use as our example, um, happiness. So hence, happiness is a construct. It's something that we, 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 we made up, but it's a commonly accepted idea, but it's something that has to be defined. You can't just point to something and say, there, that is happiness. Um, like objectively, that's happiness. You have to define it with something. Okay, so Let's, again, looking at theoretical, let's look at face validity. Face validity refers to whether an indicator seems to be a reasonable measure of its underlying construct just on its face. For example, learner engagement is a construct that is often studied in the classroom and the amount of time a student spends on a task without being reminded to stay on ta task seems to be a reasonable measurement of engagement. So face validity is often established using experts to judge the adequacy of a specific type of observation. So in, in this example here, you could say that if you ask somebody to point to which of those faces reflect their current level of happiness, that just on its face, you could say, yeah, that's reasonable. That, that, that makes sense. So that's face validity. So content validity is an assessment of how well a set of measurement items matches with the relevant content domain of the construct that you're trying to measure. As with face validity, content validity is often established using experts to judge the adequacy of the set of items. So in this case, the content validity is looking at the text here and asking, your, and, and asking yourself, well, does that does, do the words reflect um, something that could be considered um, happiness, enjoying life regardless of what is going on and getting the most out of everything? So again, is that valid? Is that a valid description of happiness? Well, in theoretical, it would be asking the expert whether or not they think it is. So those are different than empirical ways of determining um, the potential validity of trying to measure a concept, like in this case, happiness. So 
Convergent validity refers to the closeness with which a measure relates to or converges on the construct that is purported to be measured. Convergent validity can be established by comparing the observed values of one indicator uh, of that construct to the other to another indicator. And those two should be high. So in this example, if somebody rates very happy on the on the instrument at the top, they would likely select a nine or a ten on the bottom um, on, on the bottom measure. And so you can use the top measure to help validate the bottom one or vice versa. Now, discriminant validity refers to the, the degree to which a measure does not measure or that it discriminates from other constructs that it's not supposed to measure. It can be very important. So discriminant validity is established by demonstrating that indicators of one construct are dissimilar from those of another. So in other words, you can look at this and if you um, and if somebody rates that they are um, very unhappy, then on on one measure, then and that would be a um, a one, then on another measure, they should rate a five or something like that. Um, again, that's assuming that one of these has been somewhat validated um, previous. So this should not be equal. Predictive validity is the degree to which a measure successfully predicts a future outcome that is theoretically expected uh, to predict. So for instance, how well can standardized college admission test scores predict academic success in college? At maybe as measured by GPA or dropout rate or something. Turns out SAT scores really are fairly predictive. That's why they're still being used. So in this case of happiness, you, you should be able to predict that if, some, if a population scores high on the very happy scale on the left, that they would likely have fewer incidents of being on antidepressants than people who rate themselves lower on that. You should be able to predict that and you could measure that. So that's empirical. So concurrent validity examines how well one measure relates to other concrete criteria that are presumed to occur simultaneously. So in other words, this would be giving somebody a happiness scale right after they were just invited uh, to a, a party or right or right after their favorite song was played or or they, they were they were you know in the middle of a dance party so you can assume based on their behavior at that moment that they are all happy so they should all rate very happy or somewhat happy on the scale so that would be concurrent validity now concurrent validity and predictive validity are two types of criterion related validity Again, the difference between concurrent and predictive rests solely on the time at which the two are administered. So the very last objective that I just wanted to end this presentation with is a big broad one, and that is that given a description of a research investigation or, or a paper, you should be able to identify and classify the methodologies that are, that are being employed. And it's worth noting that many studies include more than one uh, type of method. So just to review in positivist, we have true experimental types, quasi-experimental uh, correlation, field surveys can be positivist, and so can action research. So those are positivist in nature, as well as the use of secondary data, historical data can be positivist. And I describe these in the notes. Now, with interpretivist, you can um, examine uh, case studies are a good example, uh, focus groups, ethnographies are good examples of interpretivist um, research, and also, as I mentioned, you can action research can be um, can really fall into both camps. Um, so pay attention to that, and I will say that that you're going to be tested over very obvious method types. So I'm not going to I'm not going to explain an action research project and have you pick which one because both would be appropriate in that case. So 
So that is, hopefully this gave you a good start uh, for better interpreting all the notes for part two.